Welcome to another episode of Electable. I'm Deb Chubb, and this podcast is sponsored by Indiana Women's Action Movement. So uh, we are moving on with our series to introduce um, wonderful Democratic women running for the state legislature in 2022. And today we are super fortunate to be joined by Heidi Weidinger, uh, who's running for House District 5 up in South Bend area. And so, um, so let's get right to it. So Heidi, welcome. I've worked with you in the past and I've just really come to just so admire all of your work um, in St. Joe County. But um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and tell us why you're running. Absolutely. Thanks, Deb, for having me. And um, for the listeners, Deb and I have forged a really awesome relationship as we work through public health policies that are related to lead poisoning prevention. Um, so why I am running? You know, a conversation like this can never um, uh, be started any other way unless I talk first about my childhood for a moment. My parents raised me and my three younger sisters in the idea that we have freedoms here in the United States and that we should be inclusive of all people. My parents were born in Europe during World War II and they had difficult experiences during World War II that solidified those values. And then when they became parents and had my sisters and I, they brought those values to us. So family is at the epicenter of everything that the Bitinger girls do and the families that we now have. And we focus on freedom and inclusion. So now fast forward to um, here we are in this post row era. And on Saturday morning after Dobbs was announced, I came downstairs and saw my two daughters sitting at the kitchen table. And the younger one who's 19 years old is sitting there and I can see that there are tears in her eyes. And I thought, my goodness, what else has happened now in the world? And she says, mom, I'm not even a whole adult yet. What does this world hold for me? Where is my future in all of this? And it was bone chilling. The, the whole room was quiet. My 25 year old looks at me and says, mom, it's time. And I knew exactly what she meant. I had to run. And I look at the two of them and I said, it's time. I have to run, don't I? This is it. And the truth is, Deb, I had already been thinking that this is probably what was going to happen. And this just tipped the scale. I'm angry because my daughters will not have the same choices that I have. I'm angry that our leaders have let us down, let my daughters down, and our leaders have let the country down. And so this is why I'm running. So I'm thinking about freedom. There, there, there's a number of things we could be talking about, right? But some of, the, some of the top ones, of course, are women's rights in the most personal of choices. When and how we bring children into this world, that should be our decision. It should be you and your partner's decision of how you wanna do those things. Freedom to vote, right? With no intrusion from somebody else, it should just be made easier. Not, this, is this is guaranteed in our constitution. And yet for some reason, it's not easy to vote in the state of Indiana. And of course, I am very, very at top of my priority list is quality education. These are the things that I am most concerned about. Um, and I am focused on those freedoms and a campaign that is inclusive. I want people to feel welcome, people who have not been welcomed by the Democratic Party perhaps before. And this is our time to come together now and fight against what is happening with um, women's rights here in Indiana. That's great. And I just want to take a moment to recognize the work that you have done on the health department as the president of the county health board. I'm sure there's a longer name, but that's what I'm calling it. Um, you have done so much work. And like you alluded to earlier, our work together on um, trying to prevent lead poisoning and young children in particular. Um, at, at the Board of Health, you did such an amazing job. I mean, many of these county boards and other counties have people that just really don't do much. They rubber stamp things. They don't really do initiatives uh, to really impact public health. And um, you, in fact, have really put together a, an amazing team uh, at the health department. They're doing so much more outreach. You found funding for them and, um, <clears throat> and found ways for them to reach out to people and get um, information about programs. I mean, one of the things that you and I learned was that even when there are programs available, 
Many people don't apply because they don't understand it. They don't know it, um, particularly renters who might have to involve landlords um, are very leery. Landlords are leery. And so it takes a lot of outreach and a lot of work. And you have just done an outstanding job of working to improve public health in, um, in St. Joe County. It is an urban area, a lot of older facilities, a lot of older you know, manufacturing, legacy pollution uh, from uh, old industry. And so, so I just wanna say you are so effective in what you do. And, um, and I'm, just, I would, I'm just thrilled at the notion that you could come to the State House and really have that same kind of impact, which you absolutely right. can. So, um, so as to public education, I think um, you, know, you work um, at Notre Dame, you understand the value of high quality <laughs> education. And, um, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about what you think needs to change in Indiana. We all know the problems, right? Huge right. numbers of teacher vacancies. Um, and where that's going to lead um, without making a change to what we pay to teachers, without making changes to how teachers can negotiate contracts. Um, you know, where are we headed and what can you do about it? Well, I think where we're headed is in the wrong direction um, for all the reasons you just said. Um, we do have a teacher sh shortage in Indiana and in the United States. And what are we doing to incentivize that? Right. So how are we flipping this around so that we welcome more people to come into teaching? Because people do want to be teachers. And yet when they see people being villainized, they don't want to go into that profession. But as you can see now, the parallels of what's happening, public health has been villainized across the United States. Over 2000 health officers have left their their posts because they've been threatened. They're, they're marginalized, they're, they're villainized, all of those kinds of things. The same thing has happened to teachers, right? They're taught that they don't have enough expertise to determine the curriculum. Um, and now we, now we see the same thing happening with healthcare professionals, professionals and physicians, right? In this space of women's healthcare, right? What, doctors don't know when to do procedures or when it's appropriate to do one procedure versus another? This is... It's, it's like we're living in a dystopian nightmare. We are it does inside. feel like a race to the it bottom, does. doesn't it? Yeah. Because people have gone to school to earn those credentials so that they can, so they can impart that expertise on all the rest of us. I mean, I went to school and I had teachers, right? I went to college and now I have a career, the same as you, Deb. But what our legislators would have us believe is that our teachers are not worthy and that they are unseen and that they do not have the expertise to be teaching our kids. And that in fact, we should be having other people in the classroom. I do not understand this line of thinking. I don't understand it. I wanna bring back where we value our teachers and my time with, so I spent five years at South Bend schools and I spent five years at PHM schools and they were amazing experiences. But I do wanna share this one story because it is truly a highlight of my career is that when I started at um, Penn High School, um, which is in Mishawaka, Indiana, the graduation rate was 75%. I wrote a grant for one and a half million dollars that was to be invested in teachers, developing leadership, pedagogy, um, uh, the curriculum, building teams so that every student was known well by at least one adult in the building in five years just five years, we went from a 75% to a 96.1% graduation rate. Wow. Outstanding, Yes. outstanding. And the work that the teachers put into this, you don't know more people who are committed, passionate um, and, and, and loving. They're just loving. They care about their kiddos. They want their kids to succeed in their schools. So this notion that they don't know what they're doing and we need to tell them what to do inside the classroom, uh, is, is, it's incomprehensible to, incomprehensible to me because I have seen the power of when teachers come together to work together to improve things, improve student engagement and achievement, it happens, it happens. And so I am for one on the side of the teachers, the students and the parents but parents have always had access to the schools. They've always had access to the schools. So they're, they're part of that. They're part of making um, schools a positive 
environment and making it a productive environment. So this is what we need to be investing in, is our teachers. Number one, give them what they need, get the legislator out of their way so they can do the job that they were hired to do and trained to do, quite frankly. Right, and I, I hadn't really thought of it before you said it, the, the parallels between that and how medical professionals are now being treated. I mean, right. same thing. Legislators are pretending that they know more than doctors about right. how to treat women's health. And, yeah. and that is, again, just shocking. I mean, talk about your government overreach. <laughs> that, yes. I mean, that they think that they can decide when a woman is close enough to death to be treated by a doctor. Yeah, and so what we're seeing happen now at the state with the stories of women coming forward and talking about what their experiences have been like. And um, I'm going to quote Ed Charbonneau, Senator, who said that his, his, he was just sick to his stomach. He was just sick to his stomach about what he was hearing. And he said that this was a bad bill and that he hoped it would be made less bad by the next level of legislators who were going to be commenting and voting on it and so forth. And what I wanna to say to that is, the reason that we can't come together on this is because this is a very, very complicated issue. These decisions are made in sometimes in the moment with a physician, the woman and her partner, and it needs to remain so. We don't need outside forces trying to help a doctor and, and the woman trying to figure this out. The fact is, is that the vast majority of pregnancies are wanted and that they start out healthy and that sometimes they become unhealthy. And then these other very tragic decisions have to be made, very tragic. And I think that that is what is being missed. And they wanna be able to write some sort of legislation that legislates that all away. And it won't happen, Deb. It just won't happen. This is, this is nature, right? I mean, this, this is stuff that is beyond our control. We can't predict why a healthy pregnancy go, becomes unhealthy. And in fact, it happens more, more often than we know, more right. often than we believe. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. We don't, well, we don't, and I was we don't too, tend I to think... talk about it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, at some level, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of gratified to know that now these legislators are going to have to talk about all of the very difficult, very ugly things that women endure. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I'm ready to have that conversation. <laughs> and I'm so sure you I. are, too. I so, am, too. Uh, yeah. And so and part of the issue, with, as I see it amongst the legislators, is that they all signed a pledge um, and that pledge got them a lot of money. Um, and the pledge was that they would, you know, oppose abortion uh, on any terms from some national, you know, anti-choice organization. And those those organizations bring in a lot of money. And, oh, yes, they um, do. And now, of course, they're being called on to fulfill their pledge. That's right. And, that you know, organization, sure you know, Deb, uh, I don't have the, the exact name off the top of my head, but the abbreviation um, is ALEC. A-L-E-C, right? Mm -hmm. And for, for the folks who are listening, ALEC is a national organization whose sole function is to create these pieces of legislation, invite people to an offsite location outside of their state, and then for them to adopt that legislation, take it back to their state and get it passed. My opponent has been celebrated by ALEC. He has actually been legislator of the month a couple of times. Well, and it's not just any legislation, it's very conservative, ultra conservative legislation. Um, ALEC right. is American Legal uh, Exchange Corporation or something like that. And, and there are no Democrats involved in ALEC. Uh, they are all Republicans and, they, and it is very conservative legislation that, um, that they hand out uh, with a check. Um, That's right. You know, and this and, is why when people think to themselves, they're like, oh, how is it that like 12 states are passing the same law at the same time? We're thinking to ourselves, are they all communicating with, your, with each other? It's ALEC. Right. It's ALEC that is orchestrating all of this. And the way that ALEC runs is that there's a state legislator who sits on a committee as a chair and the compliment, the co-chair is a person from a private organization. 
So you've got energy sitting there, you've got manufacturing sitting there, you've got the oil industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, these, and this is how it is that industry is buying out our legislators. And of course, Deb, I don't have to tell you, I don't have to tell your listeners. I mean, this is what we have to get out of. We right. have to- And I, I just want to add to that, that it's it, one of those industries is the private for-profit education industries. Um, yes, who are is. really wanting to make ed- public education privatized and for profit. And that's so, right. so that's how that falls into that heading, um, as well as anti choice uh, forces. Out yes. There oh, yes. The list is running. long, Deb. The list yeah. is long. Yes. So, right. And so, and, and it, like you say, it's shocking when you see a bill like last year, 1134, the one that was going to dictate to teachers what they could and couldn't say in the classroom. Well, that same bill actually passed in 15 other states. And so when people say, oh, this is mom and pop, you know, stepping up to get influence on their local school, that is just a total lie. Right. Um, This is a a nationally produced piece of legislation that is being, you know, tested out all over the state. So, um, so there's no basis to say this is what people in our state want. That's right. Because our people in our state, except for that legislator who sits on ALEC, um, is the only one who is out there discussing that bill. That's right. You know, Deb, in the short time um, that I've been running, and so now I'm I'm at four and a half weeks ago about that I filed. Um, Yay! Um, I've had a um, quite a few of my Republican friends have reached out to me by phone to have a conversation to say, I don't recognize this Republican party. I do not align with this idea that we are canceling out women's rights or stealing their rights, telling them they don't have the right to make healthcare decisions about their own bodies. And they're saying, no job is too little or too small, put me to work. So this is, this is big. This is the moment. This moment is being galvanized by the fact that this small extremist group of Republicans is stealing our rights. They're stealing our freedom, our bodies, our vote, our education, you name it. And so, um, the, and, the, and, and it gives me energy. When I have those conversations and I hear that, do you know what it reinforces for me is that as Americans and as human beings, we agree on far more. We agree on so many things together. We are more alike than we are different. And it just solidifies that for me. And it reinforces human nature that we want to be connected and we want to be seen. We want to lock arms with other people and like we want to have families and healthy kids and happy kids and, and a nice school to go to, right? And a theater where I don't have to worry about you know, somebody bringing in guns and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I'm energized when people are reaching out to me to say, hello, I'm so glad you're running. And can I tell you why I'm so happy that you're running? Um, I, this is the moment. This is the moment. Well, I am so glad that you have stepped up. Um, you are the perfect person to take on this moment. Um, and I, so um, we're almost out of time. And I know there are many issues. Um, I know that you have um, positions on environmental issues, on other healthcare issues, on public education, on criminal uh, justice, and uh, other social justice issues. Um, but people will have to reach out to you to find out your positions on those because we're almost out of time. So tell us what you need from uh, people, how can we get you elected, and how can people reach you? So right now, the focus is on strategy. We have to get people out to vote. St. Joseph County is the second lowest in voter turnout. It is essential that everybody listening is is having conversations with people to say, you need to be a voter. Be a voter. Make your plan to vote and then go grab five people and ask them how they're voting and so on and so forth. And that's how we build this coalition and rebuild this culture that we are all voters. We care about Indiana and we vote together. So I would say to folks who want to know more, get in contact with me. It's really easy to remember. It's HeidiForIndiana.com. Go to the website. You'll be able to reach out to me. Donate um, because you can be rest assured 
a lot of GOP money is going to flow into my district very, very soon. And um, I have to compete on, with that. So all donations, small and large, are accepted. Good, good. All right, terrific. And so um, you'll have, we'll go to the website. You'll find out more about Heidi's positions on all of these other issues. Um, I know this one is so important, and I'm, you know, there's, you know, it's just such a gut punch, um, you know, for women. Um, yes. what's happening. It's hard to even get your head around it. But, um, but there are many issues and I know that you have positions on all those issues. And, um, and I know that um, people will be very, very uh, supportive of all of your work. So, all right, great. So thank you very much, Heidi, for coming on and chatting with me. And of course, I wish you all the best. And I am sure that we will be watching you and we'll be back in touch and we'll be doing this again um, awesome. soon. Thank you, Deb. Thanks so much. And for your friendship. Thank you. Of course. Of course. And yeah, and we've got a lot of more work to do, don't we? On love. Boy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll be working on that too. So. All right.